Hi, this is Liz Haas with Ray Zis. Thank you for our session eight of our virtual trade shows. And I'm so excited that you are joining us today. Um, we're presenting live as we have for the past eight weeks, if you can believe it. Eight weeks, we've been going live every Tuesday. Tuesdays actually become the highlight of my week, believe it or not. So I am excited that I get to be with you. You send me your comments, send me your questions as we go through this segment, and we will do our best to them but we're here for you we're here for education and we've always said invest in education learn sand carving you have a sand blaster you have your equipment some of you take workshops you're investing in yourself so watching these trade shows or these virtual training se um, segments it we're, we're coming into your home business we're coming into your offices to train you to equip you so you can gain that knowledge so an hour of your time, you're investing in yourself. And hopefully there's something that I can present to you or our expert that can present to you that will help you in your business, that will help you to be successful. So we love education. We love the term learn sand carving because that's what we're doing here. We're teaching you how to make your business better and how you can make money being successful. So today we are going from recognition to remembrance. And you are already in the recognition industry. But how do you get into the memorial industry with home remembrance products? So I have an expert coming in today. His name is Josh Willis, and he is an expert in the memorial industry. So I'm going to welcome Josh. And you're gonna be, I'm excited to present him today. Hey, Hi, Liz, Josh. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. I'm glad I finally made it on your uh, super show. <laughs> I didn't know if I was going to get a chance. Oh, stop. Of course, <laughs> you're always welcome, and I've worked with him in shows, and I'm, every time I'm around him, um, and you're working, I'm always learning something from you. You're definitely uh, well, thank you. expert in your field. I don't know if it's a good thing or <laughs> bad things you're learning, but you're learning something. <laughs> All right. So, Josh, you are um, GM for? Raise This and Honor Life. Raise This and Honor Life. Uh, I spend the most of my time in Honor Life, um, so I have a little bit more knowledge there than I do the raise this side. Right. But, uh, and I've been doing that for, well, altogether, it's been over 25 years. 25 years in the industry. In the industry. Right. So you know sand carving, you know photo mask. I do know sand carving. I know photo mask. I know granite. I know memorial. I know cemetery construction. That's kind of what I Because you are a licensed in. contractor. We right? are. Yep. Honor Life is a licensed contractor. We do a lot of cemetery construction. We build columbariums and niches, right. and we install them, and clad them with granite. We do everything from start to finish, from design to uh, from concept to creation. So we'll come in and we help the, the cemetery owner design something, and then we actually build it, install it, finish it, and walk away when it's done. And I've seen some amazing work that you guys have done or that we have done. Yeah. So Honor Life is a division of Raisist. And so I work for Raisist, and you do a lot of work for Honor Life. So do I own you? I guess <laughs> in a way, yes. We, uh, we're owned by Ray Ziss, so I guess I'd, I work for you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, I wish. All right. So here we go. Um, you've been in the monument industry for a little over um, 25, 25 years. years. All right. So how many stones do we do a month? Um, we do right around 500 stones a month. Um, That's a lot. That, well, Seems yes, it, like is a lot. A, it is a lot. Uh, However, the majority of the stones we're doing is on the wholesale level. So we're doing those for the actual um, cemeteries. It's not a retail. If that was retail, we'd all be doing really, really good. Right. Um, but uh, that is all, that the bulk of our work is wholesale. We don't really sell a ton of retail work. So a lot of wholesale accounts. Right, okay. wholesale accounts. So um, what is the motto for Honor Life? Uh, Honor Life motto has always been honoring life lived. Um, what we want to do is we want to honor the life of someone's loved one, right. right? And how do we do that? Well, we do that by selling a premium product that honors that person. So uh, we don't take it lightly. We don't just try to do a name and date on a stone. One thing that sets us apart from other businesses in the industry is we have like unlimited lettering. We want someone to really tell the story of their loved one on that stone. On that stone. Yeah. And you can tell that story not only on a stone, but some people are cremated. A lot so of people are cremated. That's huge. I mean, cremation's on the rise for the last 15 to 20 years. And it's, uh, you know, it's almost 70% nationwide. Wow. Uh, so you, that tells you how much body burial is going down. So yes, cremation is a, is a big part of, uh, of uh, 
are on, on the rise. Yeah. So we have we have urns for cremation, but we also have niches. Mm -hmm. And what's the difference between a niche and an urn? Okay. So a an urn is something that the ashes are placed into. Yeah. Some um, samples here. Yep. Here's a couple samples of a couple different urns, and we're going to do an urn today. Okay. We're going to sand blast an urn today. Great. Um, so the ashes of your loved one are go inside of an urn. Now, what a niche is is that is where your urn goes inside of that. So when you go to a cemetery, you have body burials and you have headstones. Well, on a lot of the walls or in some of the gardens, you'll see uh, big granite structures that are broken up into squares. Actually, we have a picture up there. There's a picture up there. So that's up in Ivy Lawn, um, which is in Ventura, California. And uh, so what happens is each one of those squares contains someone's loved one. Now, sometimes that could just be a plastic box that they that they go in, mm -hmm. and a lot of times if you're taking your loved one home, uh, then you would go in something a little bit nicer. You'd see this on the mantle. Right. What's really big about cremation, or what's kind of the upside to cremation, is that you can now uh, separate, meaning you might have your loved one at the cemetery, so you have a place to remember them, but if your mom is, is in, a, in a cemetery in Las Vegas mm -hmm. and you live in San Diego, the chances of you going up to Las Vegas to seeing her on a right. regular basis is slim. Right. So what's really happened is people are embracing memorialization on different products. Maybe you have a piece of cremation jewelry that you have that has That's your right. mom in it. Um, maybe you have an urn with a little bit of mom in it, or maybe you just don't have any ashes, but you have your own way of remembering mom. And those products are really on the rise. And that's where our recognition, our awards, our trophy shops, those are the products that they can offer to this industry. Correct. So right now, you know, uh, trophy shops and recognition companies, they're recognizing people for their accomplishments, either their sales goals or achievement goals. And what we're doing is we're remembering somebody or honoring somebody that, that we love that's passed. So it's the same type of thing. It's just a little bit different. So instead of recognizing them for what they did on, uh, in sales, we're going to recognize them for who they are and so that we're constantly remembering our loved ones. Right. That's awesome. Yeah, so I know that we have a lot of samples here. Mm -hmm. um, we have, um, you know, you have some urns, some samples of wood. You can etch on wood, apply that, that masking um, to a wood surface. Uh, onyx. Onyx. We can do granite, any hard surface. Okay. And a lot of urns you're going to find are made out of hard surfaces. So they're going to be out of the granites or marbles or woods. Uh, there are some metal urns. You can engrave those too. You know, you're going right. to get a surface etch, but that, that's you something that's possible. You can use a photoresist for that. Mm -hmm. A lot of the products that people are already engraving for recognition products, those same products are in the memorialization industry. Right. So you have your vases, your, mm -hmm. your ornaments. Yep. So I know that you, you do have, because um, you have, like, if you have moms in Las Vegas, I live in California, my sister lives in Oklahoma, we all can take something home to remember our loved one. Absolutely. That, and that's the, that is the nice thing about products like this, is you can have your own way of remembering Absolutely. What was everybody's special. Everybody's different, and everybody wants to remember in their own way. Not everybody wants cremation jewelry, right. you know. Um, not everybody wants a vase. Some people want different things. And so what you have here today is just a wide variety of products um, from picture frames to coffee cups to small, simple bud vases. You know, it could be something that you want to remember your mom with a, a rose. Like my grandma, for instance, loved purple. Purple, purple. is her favorite color. So, you know, this might be something that you have in your house that you're going to put a purple rose in and you remember mom that way. Um, you know, what if mom's favorite holiday was Christmas? Well, some people remember mom with their Christmas ornaments and they have a, a custom Christmas ornament to remember mom. So now she's still being a part of Christmas, right? That's great. This is, mm -hmm. I love this idea. I've always loved the ornaments at Christmas time, remembering our our loved ones. And I know this one is a pet memorial with just a lot of text on there. Pets really huge. People love their pets just as much as they yeah. love people. I mean, they're as much as part of the family as, as people are. So yeah, pet memorials here. You can see in the, like on the, the, the mug or the coffee cup you have here, you're going to mm -hmm. remember dad every time you have a cup of coffee, right? right? So every time you have a cup of coffee, you're thinking of dad. And that's awesome because that's now, you don't have to go to the cemetery to remember dad. You can remember dad at home. Right. right. And it's the same thing with, you know, a pet. A lot of times if Bailey was your, you know, your golden dog, 
you're going to remember Bailey at home every time you have a cup of coffee. So people want these products. They want to remember them. I mean, you see it, you see it everywhere. Everybody always wants to remember somebody. And so right. what we're doing is, or what you could be doing is giving your customers a way to remember their loved ones at home. So we have the picture frame. So tell, I mean, the picture frame, that's a great idea. I know it's on wood. It's on wood. You and you can, it. Yeah, you can do this on anything. It could have been, we could have blasted the glass. Um, the wood, you know, this, this particular one was a little bit difficult to get through because there was a urethane, but we did. Um, what's great about this is, you know, grandpa and grandson, this was their perfect day. And this grandson's going to remember this until, you know, he's not here. And so this was a day that they got their their big buck and it shows where they got it. They got it in unit 33B and it shows the score and it's, you know, it's just him and his grandpa. And so, you know, and that's an awesome way to remember somebody every time he does that. Not everybody's gonna want a picture frame, some do. And again, what's great about this is it could be anything. Right. It doesn't have to be a wooden frame. It could be any kind of frame you want. So blasting on the wood, what, what material did you use? We used on this one, we used SR3000 5 mil okay. because we knew there could be a urethane and we were going to have to use a little bit more pressure. What we did on that was we used the SR25, so SR a little bit 2000. thicker. SR2000. I'm sorry, SR35. SR3000 5 mil. 5 mil, yeah. 5 mil thickness on 45 the 45 pounds of pressure and... Because it did uh, take you a little bit to blast through that coating, right? A little That's bit longer than I would have wanted. Um, okay. If I was, if this was going to be something I was going to source as a product to sell people, I would probably look for an unfinished wood frame if that's the way I wanted to go. Okay. Or I would find a glass frame or something that's a little bit easier to engrave. But don't be afraid. You can yeah. still you can still do a, you know a lot of different products. Just you might want to experiment on, experiment with them before you offer them, you know, to the public. So let me, let's kind of go back to, you have your award shop, you have your recognition shop, and you have someone coming in and saying, oh, wow, you blast on granite? Can you do my stone? Because stones can be pretty costly mm -hmm. for a cemetery, for, for a memorial park. Should that person take on that job of blasting, no. blasting no. a memorial stone? No. Initially, I, I, I say no. And the reason no. I say that, not so you don't make money, right? because we want you, everybody to make money, but that is a specific product and we got to be careful with that you one thing i was telling you the other day we have to remember that this is one of the final steps to the grieving process right that stone's going in the ground and we don't want to take that lightly and just uh you know because i can engrave a coffee cup i'm going to go ahead and engrave their marker for them first of all a lot of cemeteries have a lot of guidelines so they're going to dictate the size the color uh, the material that you're using and if you don't know where to get that or what that is, you could be selling somebody a product that they can't even use or won't allow. The other thing is, is you need to make sure you know what you're doing. Yeah. There's a lot of, it's not most, there's not just headstones. There's a lot of differences in headstones. Some get a sanded panel, some are polished, some have a sanded border, some have concrete. And if you don't understand that, you don't want to do that to somebody and have their last memory or that final bit of the grieving process ruined. Right. So you should get educated before you do that. If that's something you want to do, I, I, you know, I'm all you for you take learning those it. Steps to get but educated. you need to learn those steps and learn what that is right. before you jump into it. Right, because I had um, a friend who her son, her stepson, passed away, and they were looking for a stone, and they wanted the biggest stone possible. Mm -hmm. um, come to find out, it chose the stone, the artwork, but the cemetery would not allow that size of the stone. They, the max size was only a certain mm -hmm. size, and that was it. And we didn't, she didn't realize, I didn't realize that, but there are a lot of guidelines per there is. cemetery. And there is, and every state is different. Some states you have to be licensed to sell stones. Um, you know, uh, depending on where you're at, you have to be a licensed memorialist in that state in order to sell into cemeteries. So I would say if that's something you wanted to get into, you need to reach out and get more information. And there's a lot of resources, yes. a lot of associations you can get involved with that would teach you that. But to just start off and say, hey, I'm going to do some of these products and I'm also going to do a headstone at the same time, I would discourage that because if you don't know what you're doing, you could get yourself in a little bit of a hot water. Right, and then you have the person, the family's very vulnerable. Very upset, that. and it's not, you know, you don't want to take advantage of somebody yeah. at that state. You're right, they're very vulnerable, they're not thinking correct, and uh, if you don't know what you're doing, then, you know, it's just not going to be a good situation at the end of the day. Great. So we, we also, um, I've noticed that you'll have, like on a car, you'll see like mm -hmm. the memorial honoring. Um, someone passes suddenly, you'll see like a lot of shirts that are printed with that, with it's that big. person. It's yeah. a big part. I mean, everybody wants to remember somebody some way. 
So some people want to put it on the back of their car or their truck. Uh, T-shirts are huge. I told you when I was uh, out in L.A. a uh, couple months ago before this, this whole pandemic happened, I was shocked at the amount of people selling Kobe T-shirts. Right. You know, and why? Everybody loves Kobe. Everybody wants to remember him. They well, want that shirt. You love your yeah. mom more than you love Kobe. Right. So you want to remember mom. So, yeah, you're going to get a T-shirt or sometimes you put on your car. That just goes to show everybody remembers differently. Yeah. So you have to have a, like a wide ver uh, variety of products to offer people because you want to remember your mom a certain way. I want to remember mine a certain way. Right. And we're both different. So we need to have products that fit both lifestyles. So with that, you have... Um, you have someone that comes in that just lost someone. They're looking for items that they can bring home or mm -hmm. give to family members of, of a lost one or you know yep. a loved one that just passed. How do you deal with that person that comes in and they're you know they are upset? Is there? I know there's Very a different way of hand handling it. Very delicately. Um, you really want to have. We're not trying to make money. I mean, we're we're trying to make money, but at the end of the day, it's not about the money. You have to be a. You have to have a certain personality to deal with somebody who just lost a loved one. Um, you don't want to come off as we're just trying to peddle a bunch of stuff. Right. We want to help you remember that. We have a lot of products to do that. Right. So you and have the candles. Right. And you have, we have candles. And like I said, everybody's differently. You just don't want to push products on people, but give them, a, I would suggest a, a variety. And, and pull that information out. You know, we talked about headstones the other day yes. and you said, you know, we talked about the, the birth date and the death date and then the dash in between. And a really wise man told me this a long, long time ago when I was, when I was first starting off that so many times it becomes about the birth date, the death date, but that person's entire life is summed up in just the dash. So I don't know anything about that person. All I know is they, when they were born and when they died. And so what we can the do dash, yep. is you can, get the, you can pull that information out and find out what, that, what they were about and try and help honor that person so tell them, have them so tell you about again, their like life. So again, like going back to this, this tells a complete story. You know everything about this, this grandson and, and grandfather. Right. It's summed up right here. They, got, they love to hunt. This, this frame says it all. So the more you can pull out of a person, uh, the more you can help remember. I mean, we talked about, uh, we didn't talk about tree plaques. No, we didn't. But did that's it. really huge. So let's look at the tree plaque. Um, one thing that happens a lot is... When someone passes, you might get somebody that wants to plant a tree in their honor. And so, yeah. you know, whether it's in a park or at your home, you know, tree planting is really big. And so one, another way of doing it is simple tree plaques. It's real simple. It's just in loving memory of Kay Marie Houston and has her birth and uh, death dates there. And on the side, we're just going to put, you know, the type of tree it was. And it was planted in memory of Kay in 2020. Um, you know, and this would go out. Now, this is, you could put this at home. This is really almost commercial. Right. So a lot of times what you would see is something more like the River Rock. Like or something the, like we did. The Maddie Rock Yeah, here. the one you guys did a couple weeks ago for Maddie. This one's really nice because this one would go in the yard, and that doesn't look like a commercial tree plaque, but you could put the same exact information, you know, we love you, Mom, and then you could put, you know, this palm tree was planted in, in memory of my mom on this date. Right. And now you're giving them a product that, you know, that they want and that they could use and that's functional. So the tree, the tree plaques, the river rock, mm -hmm. anything. And I I've, I've went online and Googled that because when yep. you mentioned the tree plaque, I'm like, oh, that's a great idea. I never thought about it. Tree plaques. Yeah, I mean, planting a, a tree, it's great. I mean, you, did, you guys did a tree of life the, a right. couple weeks ago was a project. And that type of thing, I mean, that was the beginning of that that family, right? Right. And almost taking it full circle, now you could do one for their grandparents that they would put out in their garden or next to a tree that right. was planted in memory of that loved one. So we have, um, you are actually going to do a project for us because we have an urn here that's metal. Like right. A, right. This one's metal with, with a wood, wood face. Okay. And this, Sandblasted. Again, this was all, both these were used uh, using the six mil because um, we went a little bit deeper on the onyx. Um, but this one's a wood face on metal. This one's onyx. How hard is it to blast onyx? You know, believe it or not, every stone is different. Okay. Uh, I have found the hardest stone is is black granite, and for whatever reason, white marble, the one that they use, uh, the military uses for their, their headstones. Right. Those are the two hardest. However, all stone blasts, uh, just depending on how deep you're going to get. Now, keep in mind on an urn like this, you're not going to go real deep. 
because um, it's not a headstone, it's not going outside. Right. Uh, it's going to be inside. So we can get a little bit better detail and we don't have to go as deep and it's still going to look uh, really and nice. you're using... I am this, using the stone, the stone tone, tone paint paints. just because it's a good quality paint. We want it to last. You know, that's another thing, uh, reason you want to steer people away from making their own headstones. If they don't understand all the different products that need to be used, they right. could create something that looks nice today but looks horrible tomorrow. Yeah, right. that's that so, guarantee yeah, that's of... That, if you're going to warranty your products, you really need to know what you're doing. But on these ones, we did use stone tone paint for both of them. They look good. You don't have to apply a lot, uh, and it... And it, and it does up. look good. I've never blasted Onyx, so that was something I, I saw that here, and I'm like, hmm, I've never blasted Onyx before. Onyx is, Onyx is a great product. It, it looks really nice. It's actually um, a translucent material, so light passes through it. So it does change colors depending on uh, the light you have around it. So let me ask you this. What's the most unique item that you've had to personalize? Well... The most unique would probably be monuments and special shapes. We've done a lot of, uh, we did a, a monument for a young girl in Florida that was the shape of a Disney castle. Oh, wow. That was pretty unique. Um, we've done like guitars and stuff okay. like that. The most unique product that we memorialized for somebody um, was probably the stock of, a, of a, a rifle. There was a rifle that was handed down from grandfather to son to grandson. And that grandson brought it in, and he wanted to remember that this wasn't just a regular rifle. This, this had meaning because this was grandpa's. And so all of their names went on it, and, uh, and that was kind of special. And what material did you use to blast that? On that one, I used the SR2000. 2000. Uh -huh, and, and I used 5 mil. We added the glue with added it. added the glue. Um, mm -hmm. it, was a, you know, it was a stock that had an irregular shape, right? So right. it wasn't flat. Uh, and I wanted to make sure it wasn't going to blow up on me, so I wanted that extra tack, that extra security, yes. so we added the glue. Right, and dealing with uh, deals with granite a lot, you use a lot of the SR2000. We do, and, and we use mask. that monument mask. That that's monument that's mask. our go-to mask, because that has a, a really um, good level of tack. Uh, the glue's basically coated on uh, in, in a real thick form. The SR2000, you have to brush the glue or spray it on, um, the, the monument material, what's great about that is it's already baked into the material. It's super aggressive, and it's thick and really durable. So tell me about what we're doing today, because we, we got something for you. We're, we're, we're kind of laying down the foundation here, and then we're going to get into a project. Um, a little bit of artwork as well. So let's see, what do we have? We talked about doing an urn. Yep. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do a black granite urn, um, and we're going to do a photo on it. So we got James here. And uh, we have a photo of him. We have his name and dates, and his his uh, and we have a, a simple epitaph and a simple uh, endearment. Keeping it simple, just real simple. We put it into the photo, which is something that's different. Yes. Uh, and then we're going to paint this, and I'm going to show you a different technique in painting uh, okay. than what you normally see in some of your other videos, where you just apply the paint to the to the photo resist right. and then clean it. Um, a lot of times when we're doing uh, more detailed photos, it's something like, like this. See, there's a lot more detail in here. A lot of times, if you just go ahead and paint that and peel the mask, you might get some of the paint to stick to the top of the mask and come off when you clean it. So what we do is um, we actually peel all the mask off and shoot the whole stone with paint. And then we're going to clean it with some steel wool. And I'm going to show you so how you the steel wool won't the scratch the off. granite. Yeah. Okay, and a steel wool. Okay. So it's just a little bit different, but something that might be different than what you're normally doing. And it might be a technique that you might use down the road. Okay. So well, we got some questions. So let's see what we have here. We have Ronnie Gale. Hi. From North Carolina. It's been a while since I've seen you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have John Jackson, um, Ontario. Nice, nice to see you. Thank you for joining us. New Jersey. Uh, we have New Jersey. We Ohio. have Jim from New York. You have, um, we have Andy from Ohio. And we have, I'm trying to look here. I'm sorry, I got the light. And we have Fred from New Jersey. Welcome. Luis from Peru. Tomashito. <laughs> One of our favorite distributors. <laughs> yes, and we have Becky from Florida. So we got a lot of people watching you. Awesome. We've got to make sure we give them some good education. I was really disappointed because they said I was going on this week. And I said, why did I have to go on this week? Why couldn't I have gone on last week? Because <laughs> last week was probably one of the funnest weeks, I think. I've watched all class. of the sessions. And um, I've actually enjoyed them. And I, it's, it's not that it's anything new, 
but it's it's really interesting to see it done in this light. And uh, last week's I thought was one of the funnest uh, to see the art glass section. So yep. unfortunately, this week's going to be a little bit more boring. No, but we um, can have some fun stuff. We can, we can have some, fun. We can have fun. All right. So we have April as well. So hi, April from Maine. So this is great. Um, we have. So let us know where you're where you're um, coming from or where you're watching from, and we'll give you a shout out. I had a question on do, where can they get black urns? Where can someone find urns? Blank. You, blank, blank urns. So what right. we need to do is is you need to source those. Um, there are so many different places to get them. In all honesty, most of the urns um, today are coming from uh, either uh, China or India. India, okay. Um, there are some that are made up in Canada. What's interesting about urns is is there's a there's a wide variety. You'll find urns in your actual area mm -hmm. that you won't find somewhere else. What I mean by that is like if you went to Hawaii, a real popular wood in Hawaii would be koa, right? Yeah. So there's people who make koa urns in Hawaii. And that really that, that those urns kind of stay in Hawaii, okay. right? And there might be an urn in your area that's kind of exclusive to your area because it means something. Like if they harvest limestone in, in Texas, there might be a good source for limestone urns in that Texas area. Um, what I would suggest people do is, you know what, go online and just you resource them, research them, find an urn that you like that's easy for you to engrave, and then you offer those urns. Because right, you're dealing with the curved surfaces on yep. some of the metal urns because you, yeah. can, you can sand carve metal. We had our metal segment, I believe it was segment three, but you can sand carve metal. So that would, the same application would apply mm -hmm. to a metal urn. Yeah, but a lot of times those urns are really fancy shaped and those compound curves make it really hard to engrave. So what I would do is source urns that, that are easier to engrave or find out a way of decorating them that maybe you're not engraving them. If it's a very uh, compound, uh, high compound curve, you might find a nice plaque that you can hang from it. So there's, nice. there's options there. But in all honesty, you, you find an urn that works good for you, uh, and then you're probably going to have a lot of people bringing you their urns. Okay, hey, so I, that's going to be I bought common. this one. Can you engrave it? Right, so, they found it online or mm -hmm. found somewhere, and they... Okay, they brought so it and they with that... Give. Um, are there any tips? Do they need to sign a release of liability? I would always have a release of liability. Hopefully the urn is empty. I don't right. know that you want to be handling a, a full urn. Uh, m that's usually going to be the case because there's sure usually a process before they get the remains. Okay. And so in that meantime, hopefully you're getting the urn and fixing it all up and then, and then engraving it so that they can put the remains in the urn when they're done. That's great. We have, um, I know that you have also, you can buy urns, art glass urns. Yeah. Co Kokomo, um, there's a company in Indiana called Kokomo Stained Glass, and I know that and they those have... Those are beautiful. They, they engrave well. They're easy because it's glass. Right. So, you know, everybody knows glass engraves really nice. So that's a that's a very nice urn. Okay. So we're going to do a photo. Um, if we do a couple more shout-outs, I believe we have here um, Bob from Grand Cayman. Welcome. Hey, Bob. Been to Grand Cayman. It's beautiful. Uh, we have uh, Manny from Northern uh, California and Marsha from Texas. Welcome. Wow. And so we will, uh, let's see what we got here. So we're going to, what I'm going to do is I actually have this photo on my computer and I'm going to do a basic steps of walking through taking a photo and turning it into a halftone image. So you're going to bear with me for a few minutes. Absolutely. And then we're going to um, wash that photo out and we're, then we're going to apply it. Now, one thing I want to take a look at is looking at this photo. Um, I created this to the halftone image. You see the dots are pretty large. Yeah. So when you're first starting out with photos, start with a large dot. And I'll walk you through that process. Because it's easier to wash out, it's easier to blast. You can see the dots. So we're going to start with a larger dot. As what happens is as you get more comfortable doing photos, go to a smaller dot. So this one's a 30 line screen. I'm sorry, I gave you something that's kind of like a. That's okay. The first thing he said was these dots are really big. So we're gonna step we'll over. We'll make it look good, Liz. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna step over to my computer here. And this right here is James. And I'm using Photoshop. And one thing when you're dealing with photos is you wanna make sure that you have the highest resolution possible with a photo. And sometimes that's not always possible. But here I have a, a good photo that we purchased, and it has good tone. I don't have really bright areas. I don't have real dark areas. If you have real bright and dark areas, those areas need to be adjusted. 
when you are doing a photo, when you're converting a photo from scratch, when you're taking this photo and you're not using a software program or like RIP software to convert the photo to halftone, when you are doing the photo yourself, you need to look at your light areas and your dark areas, number one, and then the quality of the photo. So we have James here. We're going to take a look um, at the size of this photo. We're just going to go under image, and I've already sized this to a 6x4. That's the size of our photo that we are going to be applying to um, the urn. So we already have this set. We have 300 um, resolution here. Okay. One thing that you can do, if you have a photo that's really light, or really uh, dark, let's go to our levels here. So we're under adjustments and levels. And you can take this, and you if a photo was really um, light, you can actually bring down your whites slightly. I'm just going to turn this up here. And what that does is it kind of will bring down the whites of the overall photo. And that is something that you may need to do depending on the photo. If a photo has where there's suns coming in and it's really bright, you may have to bring down those levels, the bright levels. Or if the photo is dark, you may have to bring up some of those of the darks. So that would be right here, kind of adjusting this output level. And so you're looking under levels. You see right here, you can make these adjustments. But what I did was just brought down some of my, my whites, just brought that down. You can see if I go further, it really darkens it up, and that's too dark. But it's pretty bright here. We're just going to bring it down slightly, have a light background. We're going to hit OK. All right. So I want you guys to remember here, um, this is Photoshop. Photos can, when you're, when you're converting the photo, it may not be, um, you may not have success right from the beginning. But start with a simple photo and just kind of go through the steps slowly and start with a larger screen here. We have one thing that you can do is if you go under mode and adjustments, you go to curves. This is like your colors. You can do an auto correct on color or you can, you can in, and this will depend. Sometimes you have like the sun coming in, it's really bright in a certain area. You can do an auto correct on color or you can manually adjust your levels here. And that is something that can be done. It does, it's not required on every photo, but that's an option that you have for making adjustments to your photo. You always want to size your photo before you turn it into a bitmap, before you put your screen on it. You always want to make sure your size is correct. So we have our photo. If you had some light areas or dark areas, we, we're going to use two tools. But before we do that, we're going to change this to a grayscale. So we're going to go under Image, Adjustments. I'm sorry, image mode, and we're just going to change it to a grayscale. Okay, we're going to, there we go. So here's our grayscale, okay? And then with this, if you had to adjust anything, let's say that you had a, a black shirt, you could take your tool, and let me see here, it's right here. You have a dodge tool and you have a burn tool, and those are the two tools that you would use for making adjustments on your photo. The burn tool would be to darken certain areas. The dodge tool would be to lighten. Okay, so that's, we're going to start. I'm just going to briefly show you the burn tool. This photo doesn't really need adjustments. It's a really great, has even tone throughout the whole image. But I'm going to make my brush a little larger here. I'll make the picture a little larger. And I'm just going to, I'm using the two brackets here to make my brush larger. And you would target, let's say, the highlighted area. You can see up here in the range. And you have an exposure strength here. So I would bring this down. I would always start around 2 or 3%, sometimes 5%. And then you can kind of brush over your area just to kind of darken it if it needed to be darkened. What you're doing is if you have a bright area in your photo that's really white, you're, you're not going to have dots in that area when you convert it to a half tone. If you have an area that's really dark, you're, you're, it's going to be all mask. There's not going to be any dots. So by you making adjustments, you're strengthening the dots that make up the photo. So that's one thing to remember when you're dealing with photos. We're in grayscale. You, let's say you went through a couple adjustments. We're not quite ready yet um, to convert this just yet. You want to take a quick peek at your photo. And to do that, you want to turn it into a negative. By turning it into a negative, you can see if you have even tone. We're going to print as a negative when you're dealing with a photo on a granite. We're going to print it as a negative. 
Looking here, I don't have any whites, I don't have any blacks, I have a nice even tone throughout this photo. So I'm going to go back and that turn it into a negative with a quick, um, with a quick command. I just did Command I for my Mac. You would do Control I for your PC, but it's a way for you to see what that photo looks like before you put it into a halftone. You want to make sure that there are no black areas or white areas when you turn it into a negative. So you can see here, I have nice even tone even throughout the beard. It's really nice. So now I am ready to turn this into um, a bitmap. So we're going to go under Image Mode, and now we're going to go to a bitmap. Okay, we're going to flatten our layers. Here, I already checked my resolution at the beginning. It was 300, um, 300 dpi. Here is my screen. So I'm using a halftone screen. There are many screens that you can use. I'm just showing you the basic conversion for a photo by, by you doing it, not without using software, a software program besides Photoshop. But there are so many screens that you can do, line screens, patterns. There are there's, uh, it's unlimited what you can do for sand carving a photo. We're just scratching the surface here. So I have my halftone screen. The one that we created was a 30 line screen. This one, I'm going to change it to a 40. We're using the shape ellipse. Okay, and that's kind of like an oval that's like off-centered. So we're going to hit OK. So here is my screen. I'm going to zoom in so you can see what this looks like. Okay. So you can have, I have my screen. Now this, if I printed it directly as this image now, it would be, it would print as a positive. If you remember last week, we talked in art glass where the glass artist Susan would print as a positive when she was blasting on light background, like a white um, glass or like a white granite, you would print as a positive. But if you're blasting on a dark background, we're gonna turn it into a negative. So I, I use my quick keys, um, command I, or you can just go under adjustments and hit invert. Now it's your negative. So now you have your negative image that you have that you can print. But um, what if you want to add text around it or if you want to put a border around it? You're going to take this photo and what I would do is I would save it as, um, I'm going to look here, we're going to save it, memorial photo, and we would save it as a BMP. And then we're going to open this photo up in Illustrator. So I already have it open. So I have Illustrator. We're going to import this photo like you can see here. And what we've done is we put a border around the photo. And that's simply done in Illustrator. It's going to export your photo, bring it into Illustrator. You can put your text on there, put your border around the photo. That gives it an area of, of a clean edge for blasting. And then the text. Now this is important. When you're putting text over a photo, you want to make sure that it has a white outline so that text really stands out in that photo. And that's the important part. We are recognizing. It's all about recognition. And we want to make sure our recognition, our text, is legible. So we don't want it to be lost in the photo. We want it to stand out. So we have here, you'll see the text is in white. And we put a thicker um, stroke around this, and then we have our black text, and we're just going to lay it over the top, as you can see here. And this is just imported. And we have here our loving husband and, and father and grandfather, and you have always loved, never forgotten. So you have that white text behind that, and that gives it an outline for, for that text to stand out. So that is, and then you would just print from there. So you have your negative image, and then the text overlaid, and then you print it out, and that's where we have our print. We're, we printed it on an Epson printer, um, an inkjet printer. And so now I'm going to take this print, and we're going to move it over to the wash station, and I'm going to wash it out before we have uh, Josh blast this. So here's my print, and you can see that right here. And we're going to take this and we're going to wash it out. So I'm using th uh, SR3000 3 mil. I'm going to take out a sheet. And we don't have to use a full sheet for this. We're just going to cut it down to size. Kay. 
And whatever you don't use, just put it back in your Ziploc bag. Remember, photoresist film is light sensitive. So you need to make sure it stays covered when you're not using it and keep it away from a sunlit window. Okay, so now we're gonna take our, actually, let's do this on the Luminex. We've used electrolyte many times. Let's place it on the Luminex. Now, for those of you that have been watching with me, the Luminex is great for high resolution images. So we have here our masking. We have the shiny side down on the exposure bed. We're gonna take our print face down. Okay. We're going to place our screen. Now remember the screen has that nice textured pattern. We're going to hit the vacuum. That is what's different with the Luminex compared to a regular electrolyte unit is you have a vacuum table. If you're in a hurry and you can't wait the 15-20 seconds for it to um, compress, take your squeegee and then just run over the image releasing any air bubbles. If you don't have, if you're in a hurry and you don't have that time to let the vacuum run, we're going to place this lid down and then we're going to expose for just six seconds. That's it. It's quick. So we are already done. Okay. And we're going to lift this up. And here we go. So now we have our exposed sheet. We're going to place it on our washout board. Oops. Okay, and then, oops, sorry about that. Apparently I can't align this straight. There we go. All right, so now we have to connect this. This is our washout hose. It's sold in the mask making kit. So we have a garden hose fitting that's going to connect to my faucet. Okay, and I'm going to turn on the hot water only, so make sure my cold is off. Hot water will help it to wash out faster. My water is pretty cold right now, but for time's sake, I'm just going to start. So nice, even strokes. You want to make sure that your nozzle is close to your exposed sheet. Okay. And nice, slow strokes. Once this water starts to heat up, it'll start to wash a little faster. But what's nice about using 3 mil is that you can etch. You can get a nice, deep etch using a photo and where the paint can hold. You can actually speed up your blasting uh, pressure because we're using 3 mil on granite. We're starting to see this image. The water is just now turning warm. It's coming along. You want to, you can't wash that outside. I know when some people are just starting out, they tend to take this outside. That's, that UV light will expose it in a matter of seconds. And you see, I'm using a big line screen here. That line screen is huge. Just to give me an idea of how or when to stop washing. So let's take a look here. I'm gonna turn this around kind of see our image and see this is a great way to start use a larger line screen when you're just starting out with photos and then you can increase or you can decrease that dot pattern and then increase that resolution go to like a 45 half tone line screen and you have your image will look a little more sharper but just let it dry as it dries it's going to start to have that sticky back to it so if you can see that but now we are ready to blast this. But let's see what, if we have any questions. All right. So we have, what exposure time would it be for the electrolyte? Great question, Gail. 20 seconds. So anytime you're using 3 mil, 4 mil, 5 mil, it's always going to be 20 seconds on the electrolyte unit. Um, whether it's a photo, a half tone, or text, 20 seconds. All right. So that's a great question. Hello from Poland. Great. Um, we 
have here it says um, a tip from April it says the better the quality of the original the the better quality of the original photo the better your outcome so absolutely when you deal with a, a high quality photo your photo resist is going to be exactly like it. it's going you're going to have a better um, photo when you're dealing with a higher or a higher quality um, image so let's look here we have abrasive imaging Matthias how are you give your son a big hug for me he's adorable I love seeing the pictures on Facebook so um, thank you for, um, for posting your comments, questions, keep them coming. We have Tomas from UK um, and Jim. And um, so just keep, keep the questions coming and we'll let you know. We'll try to get to them. But let's bring on Josh to do the application for the black urn and, and to sandblast that photo. So here we go. Okay, so we have a, a black granite urn. Yes. Um, photos always look good on a, on a black background with a black and white. Um, if you look at, there's some people that will put photos on, on like a red stone and they just don't look as good or they'll put them, I've seen them put on a white stone, they don't always look good. It's always better to do with a black background and then we're going to paint it white. Paint so white. Okay. first thing we're going to do is just make sure this is clean. I, I already cleaned it, but when you're doing a photo, it is, it's crucial that we make sure there's no dust on there. Um, even though these dots are kind of big, if you get a, the slightest amount of dust underneath one of those dots, it could lift. Okay. And one dot missing in the whole photo just doesn't look as good. So I'm going to make sure that that's clean and clear. And then I'm going to take this mask that you previously made. This isn't the one you just made. Right. So I have a 30 line screen um, pattern on this one. And we're going to line it up with, the, with that top edge. Okay, this one's nice. It is curved, but it's not compound. So it's just going in one direction. So the mask is actually going to fit real nice. So I'm going to squeegee all the air out of there. Okay. Now, one thing that I do with photos um, to make sure is if you're using our cover paper. This is our cover paper right mm -hmm. here, the white backing paper. Right. If you're using that cover paper, one thing I like to do is there's a, there's a silicone side and then there's a matte side, mm -hmm. right? So there's a shiny side and then there's a side that's matte. I like to take the matte side down, put it back over the photo, and squeegee it down again just to make sure. Because if you notice, when I peeled that liner, there was a, there was a little little air in there okay and so I like to just make sure that the photos down nice and tight What about using something like this okay this is a lot of people use these if I was doing a flat photo like this I might okay on this curved surface it's gonna be really easy for me to slide and it only and takes move. the smallest thing to rip up uh, okay. some of those dots so I'm not gonna use that I will use the wire wheel brush on the text I don't use a wire wheel brush on the photo because I don't want those dots to move uh, and then the last thing I do is I know you guys talked about this a couple segments ago was um, using your your thumbs it's the best burnisher <laughs> you have it's the one that God gave you so I like to make sure we get all that I was Just talking to a customer recently and he said he actually developed little calluses because he did 2,000 glasses for Mother's Day and he says he was pressing him and his wife were pressing down the mask with their thumbs on these curved surfaces and I'm like he got little calluses on his <laughs> thumbs but yes, these it are happens. your best, best burnishers. Best ones you got. So I'm going to cover this up, and I'm going to actually go, because this is round, I'm just going to go two tapes wide because I know I'm going to be over here, and I don't want to. And then when you paint, you don't want any overspray right, on painting. Right, because that's just more cleanup. Although we're going to get a lot of overspray today because we're going to paint it a little bit differently. Okay. Even though with this, with this um, line screen, we probably don't need to, I want to make sure... Um, I show you a different technique. So okay. that way if somebody does one and their line screen's a little bit finer, they'll be okay. Hey, we're always looking for the different techniques, um, educating ourselves, how we can do things, make it better, faster, easier. So Liz, you said you said something, and I, I caught this a couple weeks ago, but you always you're big on education. Yes. And we learn what are you teaching? What do we what are you teaching people? How sand, to carving. sand carving. Yeah. Right. And so we're going to sand carve this. And one thing that we talked about a couple weeks ago was that we're using a sand blasting sand machine. Sand blaster. That's so right. So I've noticed that sometimes you'll find, you know, different clients are different. 
And a lot of times you go in, I'm sure you've seen this, you go into someone's facility and you go to set them up or teach them and they don't have their, their, uh, their mixture right. Yes. Right? Yes. And they're blasting with more air than sand. And we talked about that and I said, hey, yep. we need to be, we're sandblasters. We have confidence in our material, so we need to sandblast. So if you can't see your sand, something's not right. So you'll notice that I adjusted the machine um, yesterday, and we're going to see a nice fine stream of sand coming out. Remember, the air is our propellant. The sand is our blade. So we're trying to cut the granite. Air will not cut granite. You have to have sand. Uh, it, it goes for That's glass right. as well. You need something. So our air is our propellant. And uh, our sand is our is our cutter or our blade, so we're, you'll see um, what that's going to look right, like here. Right, because you have if you're blasting with a lot of air, you'll find that it takes you longer to sandblast because you don't have enough sand coming through that stream. And time is money. Time is money. Ta our so, time is valuable. Very valuable. All right. So I'm going to put this in here. Um, it's kind of big and heavy, so I'm going to put it in a place where I think I can get to it without having to move it a lot. Okay. And then. Uh, I'm going to adjust the machine. I'm going to go up just a little bit higher. Do you want gloves? Um, I don't normally blast with gloves, okay, well, you... but I, uh, so I'm going to go without them. Without gloves, okay. And then I'm going to blast. We're going to be right around 35 pounds of pressure. Um, because it's a photo, you know, a lot of times when we do granite, we want to go just a little bit higher because we want to get it done faster. Um, but because it's a photo, we'll go down to 35 and so we'll what's, see what kind of abrasive do you like to blast with the photos? I know what I like to use, but what do you like to use? Well, in the monument shop, we don't want to be switching abrasive out all the time. So we found that we can get our photos to work with 150 grit. Um, we've even done them with 120 grit. Yeah. Um, but a lot of times, if you have a very detailed photo, sometimes that 120 can't get in there. Um, so a lot of times people say, oh, you know, photos, you need to do 220. You can, you can blast 220, but it takes a long time. And so I say between 120 and 150. So 120, 150. If you're using three mil. Yeah. Three mil. Okay. Yeah. Any thinner material than that, and you're probably going to destroy the photo. And so we're at 30, 35 pounds. 35 pounds. All right. Okay. We're going to so watch it. So I'll go ahead and blast this. The first thing I'm going to do is the photo, and I'm just going to do even passes. I want to remove the, the membrane with the first pass, okay? And one thing that's key about photos is you you want to make sure you blast long enough to open up all of the dots, but you don't want to over blast to where you start losing the dots. So I'm going to do that one, that first pass was nice and slow to remove the membrane. And then what I'm going to do with my second and third pass is just a little bit faster. And this one is just making sure I'm cutting just enough to make sure my paint's going to bond. Again, if you're looking, you can see my stream of sand, right? A nice, nice smooth stream of sand. That's how we usually adjust them and uh, have them set up either at the shows or if we're setting up a new customer. You want to just be able to see that sand. Still clean enough and clear enough, I can see everything that's going on in the cabinet. Now I'm going to do the text. Text, I'm gonna do a little bit deeper. I'm actually gonna turn the pressure up just a little bit higher for the, for doing the text. So we have a question from John. It says, when would we use nine mil versus a monument grade photo resist mask? If we need to go really deep, we're not going to go very deep on an urn because the font's not that big. But if you're going, you know, an eighth of an inch, a quarter of an inch deep, you want to jump up to the nine mil or even the monument material. So the monument material, 
uh, you have to blast at high pressure. Yeah, you need to blast at least 70 pounds of pressure just to get through the membrane and the glue. And then what, I know a lot of our monument shops are using the monument grade film, mm -hmm. but they're blast, they're using, a, I wanna say a 60 or 30 grit. Yeah, 36, 60 grit is common. Sometimes we use a 40, 70 grit center ball here. Um, So I've found, I've actually um, had some of our customers use the monument mass for brick pavers when yep. they're dealing with like a, a very difficult concrete paver. And it's, it's hard to blast and they're doing several hundred of them. Very and, common. And so they want to blast at high pressure, like extremely high pressure using a very coarse grit. That's when I've put them in a monument grade mass. It's, as well. Yeah, because because you're blasting at such higher pressures, it goes really fast. You know, this is, I'm still under 40 pounds of pressure. If I was, you know, using a thicker grit mask and I was blasting this, this would already be done. So what I'm going to do with black, what I like to do is I like to blast until I just see the bump, especially on an urn. Again, this isn't going outside, so we don't need to go a quarter of an inch deep. Uh, in some cases, you couldn't go that deep anyways, you'd blow through it. So. What I'm gonna do here is I blast just until I can start to see the bumps of the granite. That's really common with black. So you can kind of point out. I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but it. there's a, yeah. see how those, those little bumps show up here? That's very characteristic, characteristic of black. And that's when I know I've, I've blasted uh, enough. I'll blow this off and just make sure, one thing I like to do is make sure I've gotten everything in the in the photo. And a lot of times what I'll do is go back and concentrate in the darker areas to make sure that I opened all those dots up, right? So I'm just gonna make sure, I, on the, the lighter areas, you know you got it, but sometimes in the hair or in the clothing, you wanna make sure you open those dots up. Do the bottom of that. Nice. I'm gonna blow it out. It's really important that you blow it out because um, you don't want there to be a layer of dust between your paint and the stone. Okay, so there's our, there's our blasted piece. You can see that we've definitely etched all the polish off of the, um, the black where the photo's at. And then on the text, we went a little bit deeper. You can see those bumps just start to form. Now, yes. every granite's different. Not all of them are gonna have bumps. Some blast away smooth. But on black, it's very common. Um, not common, it's just gonna happen every time. It's so hard that it blasts and it leaves like little nodules. Um, what's nice about black is if you blast deep enough and you get those nodules and you use gold paint, it looks like gold nuggets. And so nice. that's you know the, probably the best color just because of contrast. But the best color to use gold paint on is always going to be a black stone because you're going to end up with a really, really nice look. Okay. Uh, nicer than other color, other colors so of traditionally granite. Traditionally, I would, I would paint it at this point. Normally, we would, we would, um, and I'm still going to. Okay. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint the text first, and I'm going to, um, I'm just going to tape off the photo. Okay. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to clean everything off, and then we're going to paint the photo, and I'm going to clean it up with steel wool. All right. Uh, and steel wool, what it's going to do is it's going to take all the paint off the surface but it's not gonna pull the paint out of the engraved area. Uh, and it's a very special steel wool. It's not the one you're gonna use That's at home to say. clean pots like and I pans. Like I got some at home. <laughs> nope, not that one, because that one will scratch. What we're gonna use is a, um, it's a four aught or a, okay. you know, uh, four zero 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 steel wool. It doesn't feel like steel wool. No, steel wool. it's very smooth. It'll actually polish. They use this for polishing different types of metal. So we use it on the granite because it'll clean up the paint and it won't, ruin the polish okay so that's that's why we use the steel and where wool. can you buy that you can buy this anywhere you can buy this at um, home depot, home depot lowe's. lowe's menards um, ace okay. hardware any type of those hardware stores um, or uh, that have steel wool you may not find it at a grocery store because okay. the one they sell at the grocery store is the it's one that you coarse. use for yes. for cleaning your pots and pans this one's a real a little bit finer okay. and they have different categories they have like a 
uh, zero, double zero, triple zero, and then the quadruple zero is the one you want to use. Quadruple zero. It's okay. the smoothest one. The okay? smoothest one. So, so remember that when you're buying, if you have to buy steel wool. What I'm going to do is we'll go ahead and paint this. And you know what? That gold paint's there. So we'll go ahead and do the letters in gold. Okay. And I'm just painting, the, I'm just taping this off so I don't get any gold paint in my, in my photo. Oops. Sorry about that. I was okay. going to turn on the... And then again, we're using a really good quality paint. Um, so we don't have to use a lot, right? Right. And I already used this earlier this morning, so I know it's, it's pretty, it's shaked up pretty good. But we're just gonna do a couple light coats. Now, if you look, you can kind of see those, those nodules I was talking about. And so it has um, like a nice texture. It has a texture. very nice texture. Yeah. yeah, granite has a nice texture. So. We could have went just white paint, but in this case, we're just gonna do the gold. We have it here. How are we doing on time? We're, we're doing good. A few minutes, we're doing good. You know, I, I, when we first started this, I'm like, okay, we're gonna do 20 minutes. And I don't know what happened. 20 minutes turned into 50, 50 turned into an hour, and then an hour turned into hour and 10 minutes last week. So I keep taking more time, but Thank you guys for staying with us. I know I see we have Chris from Arkansas and we have Candace joining us. So, so, and Tara, thank you guys for watching and keep your questions coming. We'll get to them. Okay, so now what I'm doing is just peeling the mask off, okay? And then what I'm gonna do is take the... Uh, and I do have some, do you want a razor and glass yeah, cleaner? Yeah, I'll take a razor. I wanna clean the, the mask off of where the photo is at. I have a razor up in the top. And I'm gonna. I can take that for you. No problem. And I'm gonna take a. Do you have a metal? Yeah. Right. Yep. So, using a good razor, making sure the blade is clean. I'm just gonna take and remove the mask. You want to use a good razor. If your razor's dirty, you'll scratch the granite. Okay. So this one is a is brand new, so it's good. And then I'm going to go ahead and clean the rest of this mask off because I don't need it. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I, I thought we had some um, acetone or white gas or something. Yep, I have some. Any kind of solvent. This what I'm going to do is, is carefully, acetone. acetone's good. What I'm going to do is carefully, I want to make sure there's no dust inside that photo so that my paint is going to bond well. So what I'm going to do is just clean it to make sure that it's you're cleaning the surface a little bit with of the solvent and the reason I use the solvent is not for the film because the film's going to come off with just water right I want to make sure that I, I don't want to use a water-based product because it takes longer to dry and if there's moisture in the stone that could cause the paint to separate down the road okay so we want to use is something like a solvent like a um, like an acetone or a lacquer thinner or something like that just to clean off and make sure there's no dust in the um, in the photo. So anytime you deal with solvents, um, white gas, um, acetone, you always want to make sure you work in a well ventilated area. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you have to wear gloves. You just want to make sure you take those safety precautions when you're using solvents. Look at the at the um, warning labels yep. on the products. And then how about a little bit of, not this tape, but the um, painter's, painter's tape because it doesn't stick as much. Okay, and what go. I'll do is I'm just going to cover up the areas that I don't want to get over sprayed with white so that our cleaning isn't as much, right? The less time that you spend on it, the more money you're making. Exactly. Time is money. And I like what you did with this photo is you put text in there, so it's gonna look, um, it's look nice. And this one right here, um, we're looking at the Robin Williams plaque. This was actually created by um, Abrasive Imaging as a sample, but he, used, he did this pattern here and Corel. So it's a great um, pattern um, using Corel. So it just gives you a different look. Remember I right? personally like those um, better. I like those dithered patterns. Um, I think the photos look better, but this is what the problem you might find is that with this, people want consistent. And so, hey, can you match this photo that we already did? You know, so sometimes they won't go with a newer style photo. Um, but 
nonetheless, I still like that. So this is an, a nice little plaque for like a home remembrance yep. as well. You can put it on an easel or, or hang it. And so again, what we're going to do is very light coats. I'm not going to go a lot of paint because we're just highlighting it. So we've removed the mask and now you're adding the paint. Now I'm adding the paint. It's almost like art glass. Oh, well, not as fun, <laughs> but almost. <laughs> Trying to make me feel good. It's a consolation prize. <laughs> so the key to this technique, though, is letting the, the paint dry. If the paint is wet and you try it, you're just going to smear it. And then you're going to have a mess. So what I want to do, this paint does dry pretty fast. What I'm going to do is just hit it with this blow dryer just to make sure it's not gummy. That's what I want. So I can kind of scratch that off of my fingernail. Then what we're going to do is I'll come back and I'm going to take off all the tape. All right. And you'll see that photo's there. It's got that paint on there. And then what I'm going to do is just with this steel wool, I'm just going to buff the paint off. And you'll see as I start to go over it, that photo starts to appear. Wow. Shaking the whole table. Got an earthquake coming up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are in California. That looks great. So you can see it's a nice bright photo. We didn't lose any dots. So, the, so let me go back to, because I know we're, we're kind of wrapping it up here on time. but. When would you use this type? Because you said 30 line screen is a little. It's a little much. I probably could have gotten away with it. Here's what happens when you have a photo that has a really fine line screen, you know, maybe 45 and up. A lot of times those dots get really small and they're so small that when you paint it, the paint wants to stick to the top of the mask. And when you peel it off, your paint just comes right out because we're not blasted very deep. It's just right. a surface. Just a edge. surface edge. So what I like to do is I like to go peel all that mask off. So when I paint it, the paint's bonding directly into the stone and there's no mask layer that I have to try and worry about getting through or having the paint adhere to. And using the right paint? Using the right paint is key. So I'm gonna yes. clean this and off. It actually was pretty quick. Once yeah. you blasted it, it, it went for really mm -hmm. quick. Got a little bit of residue from the paint because I peeled the mask a little bit early. And what would you use to take off the residue? I'm just using Windex and a microfiber. Um, a lot of times, you know, you'll see the guys in the, in the shop, they use, acetone or something on a rag, it's because they know what they're doing and they're careful not to, to wipe it off. But if you use acetone right now, you'll strip the paint right out. So what I tell people, especially if you're just starting out at this, just use Windex and a, uh, and a blade. You can see there's a, that's going to dry because that's moisture. Yep, you can turn it on. There you go. And there's the, the finished product. Nice. So I hopefully we gave you some tips, some ideas, how you can branch out and expand your product line. As always, we want you to invest in education with a simple YouTube video. So subscribe to our YouTube channel, YouTube forward slash YouTube.com forward slash sand carving and hit subscribe. If you like the video, give us a thumbs up. One thing we didn't mention that yes. we talked about yesterday was how does someone market this? Where do they go? There you go. So that's, if, that's, that if, is right. If you're going to get into this market, where do you go? And I think the best place to start is actually be at a funeral home. Um, cemeteries probably aren't going to be as helpful, but funeral homes are already selling these type of products. And that might be a good place for you to start. I mean, our, obviously your own client, your own active customers are a good place because everybody loses somebody. But if you're looking for new business, I think marketing to a funeral home, funeral home. would be good because they're already selling these types of products. Because so cemeteries, they want to capitalize on the, yeah. on the products, but, but going to directly um, to funeral to homes, funeral they're homes. already dealing with the families and they're already selling these you know, types of products to the families. So it's a good place to start and advertise with, with them and say, hey, here's some things that we offer that you could yeah. offer your families. And I think that would be a good place to start. Well, I just want to mention we have Paul. Paul Becker, thank you for joining us. Oh, Bill. You know what? Paul is amazing. I'm just going to talk about yeah. Paul for a second because Paul is a guy who came in and he said, hey, I want to do I want to do final dates and headstones and I don't know what to do. A guy who said, 
educate me. And you're yep. big on education. Right. And so he didn't just he didn't just talk about it. He he was about it. Yeah, he came into the class. He invested a lot of money in on-site equipment that we provide because yep. Razus sells a lot of different equipment that besides just regular traditional sand, sand blasters. blasters right. And he actually came out and I think he did three or four days of training. We went on on site. We did some on sites here locally. We taught him. And then I didn't just not hear about him, hear from him. I hear from Paul all the time. In fact, last week I got a, a text message from Paul and it said, hey, look at my first stone that Honor Life did that we installed. So he went oh, wow. from, he started off small, you know, he started doing final dates, which he still does. Yeah. Um, and he does his final inscriptions. He has, he's got a business of it now. It's not just a hobby. Uh, he actually, he's actually doing it. Uh, and now he's, he's setting monuments. It's just a, it's a real great um, story that Paul, uh, uh, with Paul, I re I'll never forget Paul because he, he actually did it from start to finish, got the equipment and made a whole business of it. And, and I'm so proud and of you him. never, you never know. It's like some people can buy everything and then they just let it sit for a little while. And then eventually they start getting up and going. I'm hearing about a lot of people now with these, with these online classes or with the virtual trade shows, they're pulling out their equipment, they're pulling out their mass being kits mm -hmm. and they are getting ready they're starting to do products starting to do engravings so we just want to keep it up thank you paul for joining us billy from compton california he's another one that took our classes so we just want to thank you we hopefully we gave you some good tips josh thanks for joining us today oh, pleasure. i know you're fun. a busy man but subscribe again to our youtube channel if you have any questions email us facebook um chat we're here we're, we're um, raises.com Take a look at our website and some products. We'll talk to you soon. See you next Tuesday.